It is Thursday, April 8th at 7.01. Um, this is the uh, Bell Brooks River Creek Board of Education meeting in public um, for the purpose of conducting the school district's business and is not to be construed as a public community meeting. There is time for public participation during the meeting as indicated in the agenda. This meeting is held in person and also by live stream. Mr. Lyon, would you please call the roll? Mr. Carpenter? Here. Mrs. Dorn? Here. Mrs. Long? Here. Mr. Price? Here. Mrs. Slaughter? Here. Please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> Mr. Lyman, would you please give us the treasure chip? I'm making a motion to approve the minutes from the March 11th special meeting, I mean the March 11th regular meeting, and the March 24th special board meetings. Mrs. Long? Mrs. Long? Any questions or concerns, corrections? Minutes. All right, Mr. Lyman, please call the roll. Mr. Carpenter? Yes. Mrs. Dorn? Yes. Mrs. Long? Yes. Mr. Price? Yes. Mrs. Slaughter? Yes. Motion passes. I get a motion to approve the Treasury's report for the month ending March 31st. Your motion? Mrs. Long? Second. Mrs. Dorn? Just want to point out. Uh, Two quick things. One would be that uh, I, don't know if, I don't know if Josh has a report to put up there. The first one. There we go. Uh, you can see there that um, it shows real estate taxes at about 72%. That's a little high because we just received all of our taxes from real estate, and uh, we still have money to add to the other areas there on the revenue side. And um, it, that will wind up more of a 75-25 split with 75% local revenue and 25% of our revenue made up of state and federal money this year. So um, that's my guess as to how we'll end June 30th. That gets more and more out of whack every year, it seems like. Uh, the expenditure side, we are at uh, about 80% for salaries and benefits, and that's typical for a school district. Uh, and then the other two reports that I, I gave are the uh, revenue and expenditure pie charts, just showing in a different uh, visual format what was on the, the financial report that was up there already, uh, the breakdown of where we get money and where we spend our money. Uh, I've got several other reports here in the agenda. Uh, that's all I have unless you have any questions about any of the reports that were included. Kevin, did I understand you correctly that you said that it's essentially 75-25 this year, that 75% of our funding came from property uh, taxes and about 25% from federal and Ohio state funding? Yeah, I would say 25% from state and federal, 75% would be the real estate taxes and other local revenue okay. fees and things like that. All right, thank you. All right, any other questions? All right, please call the roll. Mrs. Dorn? Yes. Mrs. Long? Yes. Mr. Price? Yes. Mrs. Slothman? Yes. Mr. Carpenter? Yes. Motion passes. Does anyone have correspondence that they received that they wanted to share with the, with the group? Um, I think we all did. Received a very well written, um, very poignant, very thought out. Um, message from a family in the district regarding what was coming back um, from the levy. And that family inquired as to why art was not a larger part of our conversation. Mm -hmm. um, I, I reached out, I know Dr. Cosette, I think reached out to this family as well. I reached out and had a conversation with them as well. Uh, and I explained uh, my position on, on that was that it, it simply uh, is, I agree, art is super important. Um, however, it 
it didn't appear to at least me as a board member that that was a priority amongst families and parents in the district. That was not one of the top uh, things that we have been hearing about out and about. That said, I can say that for myself personally as a the newest board member since December, that's the first email I've gotten regarding the levy period. Um, so I was very appreciative for that correspondence, um, for the, the thought that went into it, and for the willingness to come forward and advocate for a program. I think we all want to hear uh, that kind of, you know, um, input. Mm -hmm. yeah. and we very rarely get it, aside from scouring social media pages, which very, very little um, positive, you know, very little comes from social media. It's usually the, you know, five or six loudest voices on either side of an issue. So I really appreciated that. And I, um, what I conveyed to that family was that I couldn't make any promises regarding art, but that it would be part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. So bringing it up. Thank you. I would agree that um, art is certainly uh, one of those fundamental kinds of classes that help you express yourself and to also uh, deal with things that you can't particularly put into words. I was, you know, I wasn't in music or uh, in some of the other events when I was in high school, but art was my was my thing. So I I haven't missed it seeing that it's in our curriculum as well. Audra, to your point, um, I've been on the board now a year or so, and we do not receive much input from the community, either through school board meetings or through email correspondence. Our email, our school email addresses are public, so they're easily accessible to the community. And every school board meeting we've had forever is accessible to the community, either in person or virtually throughout the last year when it was obviously challenging with the COVID situation. <clears throat> so for the parents that are listening today, and for those that are in attendance, if you have a concern, if you have an interest, we're not mind readers. We, we, we ha and we can't, sure enough, social media gives us a, a, a sense of a, of a pulse of the community. The front letter is saying it's not scientific, it's not attributable, uh, and so if we are not hearing from the community, that is a problem. And it, it's hard to, you know, take on assumption of guilt or responsibility if we are not hearing from the community. We hear from the community and basically your opportunities are a couple ways. Uh, contact us, come to a school board meeting, and how you vote on levies. And that's how, that's how we hear from the community. And um, so keep that in mind. If you have an interest, we need to hear from you. Um, again, it's a free society here, so you're welcome to come and speak your piece. Uh, during each, each session has an open communication period. We, you are encouraged very much so to come and speak and communicate with us via email. Um, it's, it, it's there and available, but very, very rarely used. Um, Probably the most feedback we've gotten, and Audrey sort of predated your, your arrival, was uh, with the COVID situation at the startup of school. Yeah, there were quite a few emails about that. <clears throat> but even then, I don't know, I'll make a number up here, maybe 20, 25, maybe, I don't know. But it certainly wasn't representative of the swath of the, of the district. So if you have an interest, come out and make, make your statement, send us emails, and then we'll do our best to be responsive to that. But otherwise, Every agenda, it's on there, correspondence. And almost always, we say none. And uh, Audrey, I appreciate you brought that one up tonight. Because that, again, it was a well-written email, uh, very well, the um, point was well taken. It would be nice if, if that's really of interest to the community, if there were 300 more emails behind that one. You know, we have one. So, my point. Are there anything else for correspondence? OK. Going on to a good news recognition. Move away from the microphone, try to speak up. We have knowledge, varsity, competition cheerleaders. This is the good recognition presented to the college high school. Competition with cheer squad, unrefinished in 2021. Okay, SSA, speak on it. 
congratulations to them. We have uh, two leaders on Natalie Barker, Del Levine, Libby Jason, Jamie Greer, Grace Steckler, Emma Kugler, Addie Cousins, Emma Cousins, Jamie Devine, Mike Vernetti, Sophia Arcampo, Kayla Schramm, Della Stone, and Chloe Taylor. <laughs> okay, it's time to go on to reports to the board. We have with us uh, Rachel Barker and Jill Culler, and they're going to talk to us about growth mindset and social emotional learning. Good evening to the board, good evening community members, and lots of familiar faces. Um, this is Rachel Barker, I'm Jill Culler. We teach second grade here at Stephen Bell Elementary. And we're here tonight to share with you um, what growth mindset is. And as much as we love talking about it, we thought it'd be fun to start to kick the evening off with some students. So we're gonna go to the next slide. And Rachel will tell you about the first thing you're gonna see. So you're going to see an interview right now between a student and I, and I am the BOA teacher for second grade, which means I have all of the virtual learners. So my interview is going to look a little different than Jill's interview because this is a Google Meet that I recorded with our school Screencastify, and it's just a conversation between the student and I, um, just a casual conversation. I asked her to stay on after her Google Meet, and she had um, created something to share. She wanted to maybe come to the board meeting, but her mom shared with me that she got a little nervous uh, when I asked that, so we decided on a Google Meet instead. Thank you. 
second video you're going to see is an in-person learner this year, also in second grade, um, and he's going to share about kind of extending that, what it, what it looks like when you're using a strategy and applying those with a specific example. Clearly, our BOA technology is well above my iPhone and classroom. <laughs> Way easier to hear. So, for this slide, I'm going to talk to you about what you need to know. So, growth mindset is such an awesome best practice, and there's so much to learn about it and so many ways to implement it that we don't have time. We would take up a whole board meeting if we talk, told you all of the ways. So, we wanted to highlight two of our favorite ways, which is perseverance and the power it gets which you heard Stephen highlight perfectly. So perseverance, you heard him um, talk about being in the dip. We teach our kids that they um, get stuck in a dip, and whether you know it or not, you've been stuck in the dip before. And when you have these terminology, this terminology in these tools, you can really help students or someone at home come out of a dip. So if you've ever tried a new skill and you keep trying to keep trying it, especially as adults, what do we do? We give up, we stop, we don't have time for that, we move on to something else. So that's what we don't want our students to do. We want them to really overcome that. So we really give them some strategies and tools to do that. We teach them things like trying a new approach, encourage good self-talk, stop, take a break, ask for help. And before you know it, you're standing in the classroom and you're listening to these conversations of students saying to each other, it looks like you're in the dip or a student coming up to you and saying, I'm really in the dip with this strategy. And then they're basically giving you the tool then to know like, well, I've got to stop and I need to readjust my teaching to help this student. And the power of yet is my favorite part of growth mindset because it's that I can't do that yet. And we really teach students that 
our brains do suck and grow. And, and rather than letting them stop it, I can't do that. We teach them to add that yet at the end of their sentence so that we're not giving them the power to stop trying. I even have students make their own uh, posters on their own. So like, I don't ask them to make it, but they'll make them and usually yeah. in the classroom. So I'll see them on like little posters on their desk. But this year, they made posters for their bedroom, which was so cool. And parents would send pictures to me like, they really love this lesson. So they really do love that new power of understanding that they can't do something, but they just can't do it right now. They can't do it yet. So we really love that stuff. And then our final slide, what we want to kind of wrap up with, is what does this look like in the classroom or in the school environment setting? So SEL, uh, well, on the side of the room, most of us know, is social emotional learning. And we have been doing that for a very long time here at Stephen Bell. There are prepared circles, which if you've had students go through, remember getting those emails from Mrs. Nipper, I like you know, the lesson that was taught this week, this is what we talked about. Those have been around. SEL standards were just released by the state within the last two years, um, implemented this past year. And what better time than through a pandemic to have social emotional learning goals? I believe they're pre K 12, like through the entire, it's just so important that students feel safe, students feel connected, students feel that their teacher is on their side and they're there to give them the tools and the strategies, and then they're willing to take risks. So that's something at Stephen Bell we've been doing a long time, um, and we were able to purchase these two books, your fantastic elastic brain, along with our bubblegum brain, which we have some bubblegum around. I don't know if now's a good time to do it. We've been talking about it for a while, but feel free to piece, take a piece of bubblegum, because we, we introduce this to kids, too, that your brain is like bubblegum, where you stretch it, you grow it, just like any other muscle. It's that muscle memory kind of thing. You try out different strategies. And so we were able to, with a BSBS grant, so thank you, Bellbrook, for the Creek Education Foundation, to purchase these two books for every single classroom teacher in our building. Um, two, maybe three years ago now, everything blends together, as you all know. The years are molding in through this pandemic. Um, and they are used as part of our character kid lessons now. We developed another five lessons all around growth mindset. And when those standards came out, Mrs. Nipper, along with a team of teachers, sat down and looked at the standards that were already covered by our character kid circles and then added in the additional ones that were covered by our growth mindset lessons. So those are done by classroom teachers um, in Stephen Bell K-2. Um, in addition, another way that you'll see this in our classrooms here is through a responsive classroom model. And a lot of teachers um, problem solve with kids instead of just kids coming and tattling and getting their problem solved from the teacher. The idea is that we teach kids to have conversations because they'll come and they'll tattle on the friend that's right there. And it's like, well, just talk to your friends. They're right there. Let's, let's have a conversation together. So the teacher is more the facilitator and not the fixer. And you teach kids how to solve the problems on their own. So it's like that idea that there is no problem that we cannot solve and giving them the tools and the strategies to, to get through life solving those problems on their own and not needing a teacher. It's like any good best practice, that gradual release of responsibility. So you're front loading at the beginning, you're, you're little by little passing that onto them. So then by usually the middle of the year, students don't even really need you anymore. And they're having those conversations naturally with each other and solving their own problems. Um, a huge part of responsive classroom is our morning meeting. And that's where that safety piece comes in and that hierarchy of need that kids have to feel safe within your environment. So we sit in a circle. Everybody can see everybody. We start with a greeting. We say, welcome. We're so glad you're here today. That's a huge, everybody wants to be acknowledged, right? Everybody wants to know that you, they are seen, they're connected, and that, that creates that sense of safety. And so from the greeting, then we have sharing because we need to know about each other. We need to know what connections do we have? What do, what maybe was hard in your day that you started off that if you don't talk about it in that moment, you're never going to be able to focus on your learning because it's that heavy on your heart. And so that's a safe place for them to share. So we have our greeting, we have our sharing, 
we do an activity together because every community needs to have fun together. So we, you know, do name games at the beginning of the year. We do um, guess who. So they'll put a sticker, sticky note on the back and they have to give clues about their friends and the person has to guess who is it that we're trying to do. So just we have some fun together. And then we end by having a morning message. So it incorporates so many things um, within our goals. But that safety, that, that security of knowing that this is a safe place to take risks and try out your bubblegum brain and know that no one's going to make fun of you for not knowing something. Or a lot of, a lot of times at the beginning of your kids will be like, this one's easy. Like when you're giving examples and it's like, we don't use that word in here because what's easy for you may not be easy for somebody else. And it's not about it being easy or hard. It's just a matter of having the right strategy in place to figure it out. So what seems easy to one person, we always want to make sure that that respect is there and that kids feel safe to take those risks or like that they don't need to know it, right? Like sometimes kids get in their head like, I should know this. And they're all on their own little journeys and they're all able to develop at, at the rates that they need to. And Phil leads an amazing little meeting. If you ever have a chance to sit there. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I have a, a question for you. Think back to when you were in school and you were sitting in the desk. How many of you raised your hands, took a test, and you had no idea why you were taking it? <laughs> so one of the reasons I love growth mindset so much is that it's such a powerful tool for goal setting. Our students start taking a test in kindergarten called math. And they also take tests for each teacher, every teacher. And I love applying growth mindset to goal setting for their test taking because it really gives their test a purpose. How incredible to give a student power to know they're starting at a, at a point and they can grow. Instead of just saying, hey, you're going to take this test and you have to take it three times this year and leaving it at that, which is what I used to do. Now I really use growth mindset as a powerful tool to explain to my students why we're taking it and why it's important to show growth. And if you don't don't show growth, that's okay too, but we can figure out maybe why you're in the dip. What strategies can we work on? And it has we've really seen some great success with the teachers who are using um, goal setting for that purpose. The same can be said too for any athletic ability, any goal that we're setting at home. Growth mindset is so powerful in all areas. So I've loved it for that. We really wanted to end on positive school culture because it is just so important to us and we are so lucky to be in a school that has such strong positive school culture. So we really wanted to highlight that and having leadership, thank you Mrs. Keaton, that supports and all leadership, all admin, thank you, uh, that supports best practices, life growth mindset is critical in the success of your building, of your students, and of your teachers. And we get to say that we have that kind of success because we do have that level of support. And what's amazing about that is when you believe in something that you're teaching so strongly, you don't have to even model it. It just happens. It comes out in your conversations with colleagues. It comes out in your conversations at the dinner table. It comes out in your conversation over so many Google Meets. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just incredible to see that translate into your building and to watch your friends and your colleagues become better teachers and better people because they're willing to grow their own minds in all areas of their lives. It is so important to know that you can change your mindset. It does not have to be just of education. Anything you want to add? Any questions? Anything like that you saw or you have more questions about or any additions that I maybe you use growth mindset in your life? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My hand. <laughs> I just, so I, I just want to I just want to comment, Mrs. Clark, and just call her um, fantastic presentation. Two of our finest teachers. We have a lot of great teachers. The two are are some of the finest. I appreciate that. Um, and also, if you know, this year more than any, we all need a growth mindset. We all need social emotional learning, kids and adults. But what makes a difference here and, and throughout the district also is that 
when these when we're forward thinking we're already doing these things when the time comes that you have to actually really 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 need them we're already there and you know it's a much it's a much smaller implementation hump rather than a dip uh, you know hump there if you're already doing those kind of things and maybe you can just take it to the next level even more but when we already have that base knowledge and that base structure of already implementing SEL, already implementing growth mindset, and then we were uh, hit with the worldwide pandemic, and those things are really, really, really needed, we just hit the ground running. So I think that's another key, I think, why um, I, I don't hate to toot our own horn at, at Bellbrook Shore Creek, but that's a piece of it is being forward thinking and doing those things already, just like you know, our, our K-12 Chromebooks that we already had those, again, not to the level of Google Meet after Google Meet after Google Meet, um, but at least there was a base knowledge there. We hit the ground running, and our, and our kids are going to So, appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. To our open communication time, Uh, first, we have Cassie Kipling talk with us about bus. Good evening. My name is Cassie Kipling, and I have two kids that attend the Belvoir Church Creek Schools, and the third that will be starting in the 22-23 academic year. Tonight, I would like to advocate for bringing back, at a minimum, a portion of the busing to the families on the northern slide, side of the exclusion zone. Busing was eliminated as part of the phase four cuts made as a result of continuous levy failures. The district recognized the need for the community to have busing for their children, but is not currently slated to be one of the first services reinstated with the potential passage of this emergency levy. Sugar Creek Township prides itself as an open space community, but with that comes a walkability, less walkability function for the more rural areas. South Alpha Belbrook, McBee, Berry Hill, Marshfield, Sunston, Carpenter, Little Sugar Creek, Soaring Heights. These roads are all within the northern half of the exclusion zone, and all these roads are unsafe for young children to traverse to school. There are no sidewalks, bike paths, or street lights to help these kids navigate their way. Many of these intersections are not safe for adult pedestrians, let alone small children, because there are no crosswalks. One specific example is the intersection of McBee Road in Upper Belbrook. I have spoken with the township, township and the county regarding this particular intersection because it is extremely difficult to make a right-hand turn on Upper Belbrook. The school transportation office has designed or designed the bus routes so their drivers will never make this right hand turn. If it is unsafe for a bus to make this turn, how can we expect our children to cross this busy road? I live on McBee and my house is 1.9 miles from BCI, and I do not have busing for my third grader. Safe routes to school, Michael E. Pittman Community Trail along Upper Belbrook and Feedwell has enabled a long, larger portion of the community to become walkable, but a large portion of the two mile student zone still remains dangerous for our children to walk to school because the trail does not reach this far. This past year has been especially hard on parents, but the full impact of the two-mile exclusion zone has not been felt at this time. Many parents have been working from home and have been able to drop off and pick up their children. What happens though when life returns to normal? Busing to the rural part of the district is an urgent need for our parents and our students, whether it has been vocalized in this form or not. Many parents have voiced their concerns on social media regarding busing, and feel that the board has cut buzzing to inflict pain on the community due to multiple bloody failures. How much would it cost to restore busing for the non walkable portions of the district? Most children are not mature enough to stay home by themselves until they're between 10 and 12 years of age. But based on the current model, we are expecting children as young as five to walk up to two miles to school unless their parents are able to make other arrangements. How much would it cost to bring back busing for Stephen Bell and BCI? How much would it cost to limit the exclusion zone to one mile? Has the board considered these options? Not everyone in the district is affected by the busing cuts, but reinstating busing for the students that reside in the rural portions of the exclusion zone 
would go a long way in helping out many families. And I suspect to be more affordable than what most individuals realize. Thank you. Thank you very much. Cassie, before you sit down, I'm sorry. Before, before you sign a question, um, at the very beginning, you read a list of roads and you went really fast and I didn't catch them. Could you repeat them for me? So you could also email that statement yeah, to the board members and that would probably be best. Yeah. South Alpha Bubber, Mickey, Barry Hill, Marshfield, Sussman, Carpenter, Little Sugar Creek. Slow down. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You, if you'd like, you can also email those to us. That'd be great. I got, I got Barry, 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 Barry Marshfield, okay. Sussman, Carpenter, Little Sugar Creek, and Soaring Heights. Are most of the familiar with a lot? I mean, are those the ones that are kind of? Um, Across from uh, the park down on the Little Sugar Creek, like up on the hill, is that? So is half that of them, if you go right from the school down mm -hmm. towards Cables Mill, they're on the yeah. opposite side of mm -hmm. Cables Mill. And the other half, if you go down past the middle school, they'll be on the right hand side of the road there. Okay. So there's just no crosswalks, the bike paths aren't on that side, it's not easy access to people. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. A couple comments here. And I'm going to drop my mask so you can hear me. I'm, I'm tired of the muffled and we can't understand people. And uh, so this is going to be really clear. Um, I said earlier that we hear from the community through email or through people coming to a meeting such as this. Cassie, I want to thank you for coming out with a well researched and well uh, thought out uh, statement of need. So, again, there's a couple ways we can. No, people come out and email us. There's actually another way too, just through observation. So the other day, um, I decided to uh, shake off my winter self and go for a run. And I, I like to run when it's when I can just get past the inertia of the couch and, uh, and go run. So it just so happened I was running by uh, BCI at about 2:40, and I looked and I it struck me as odd because I see cars forming at that point an L some 20 minutes before the school gets out. And that last car that was going to get in before the bike path was sitting there. And that was my first personal realization of the impact of not having busing for the school district. Or at least I should correct that. The busing to the level to which we used to provide it. Um, again, social media is not a legitimate or um, uh, sufficient way of measuring uh, community need, but that was simple uh, observation. There. And so I, I suspect over the next five minutes that we're going to have cars out on food wire and we're going to have people backed up quite a ways. And so I'm like, whoa, okay, uh, I see what people have been talking about now. Again, the second way, you know, third, and I look at it through email or coming out. It's for somebody to come and talk tonight about something I had never thought of, um, you know, about, you know, there's the benefit of busing, um, certainly beyond two miles. I think, well, kids can probably walk, at least, at least in the older days, right, kids can walk two miles. These days, it's hard enough to get my uh, high schooler to walk, you know, the three quarters of a mile through nice sidewalks of Cable Mill, Cable's Mill over to high school. That wasn't just him, it was all my kids, but uh, anyhow, it's a different, different generation, right? But, um, but certainly, I was not, I never thought about it in terms of real barriers to kids that were so motivated or parents that were so compelled because of work situations that they basically say, here you go, you've got to walk, walk to school. Uh, it's an impossibility based on where you live, even for a high school student. I don't want a high school student walking the B road uh, at, uh, you know, in the dark. <laughs> no way. And so I never thought of that. And I, and I thought back about a personal experience of my own. Uh, when we lived in Utah, uh, they had a rule there. If you're uh, el elementary school, it was one and a half mile radius. Your high school, it was two miles. Out there, it snowed a lot. People, it's, it's laughable to me when they close Wright Patterson Air Force Base, where I work, when we get a get a forecast of a half inch of snow and they, they do a two hour delay or whatever. In Utah, it would snow six or eight inches, ten inches. People would just go to school, they'd go to work, no big deal. So, uh, so kids would go walking through the snow, you know, at one and a half miles or two miles or whatever, but there was a notable exception to that. Um, 
Um, my wife, when she's here tonight, when we moved there, she said two things. Uh, we got to have air conditioning because they use what's called swamp coolers out in Utah, and they're not as effective uh, once it especially gets up in the 90s. And the second thing, uh, uh, we want, I want the kids have to be bused, or we have to live really close to the school. So guess what? I found a house that was three quarters of a mile from the school, but okay, so they weren't eligible for busing, right? Uh, no, they were. And the reason, it was a four-way highway, uh, four-lane highway, that separated us from the, school from the school. So the school district said, okay, that's unacceptable. Even though there was a crosswalk there, it was treacherous as to be, and so they bused kids that lived on the north side of, high, I'm sorry, the east side of Highway 89 in Leighton, Utah. I'm chance familiar with that. So, so this was my first realization, Cassie, with you talking about this, that we probably have an unintended consequence of just setting a hard and fast distance for where we eliminated busing based on the levy failures. If you look back, uh, when busing when it was at its highlight or its high point in the district, uh, it, it, it costs on the order of about $250,000 a year uh, to bus a kid from Cables Mill over to the high school. We don't need that. that. That's over the top. That really should have never been set up in the first place. Um, so no one, I think, can um, make a plausible argument for returning busing to what it was three years ago, let's say. But absolutely, for situations like Cassie, Cassie's brought out this evening, um, and again, with my experience of what I saw at BCI the other day, firsthand, so what I would advocate for my fellow board members to the administration, I believe we need to make a commitment to bring back some level of busing. But what I know for certain, though, is you cannot, we cannot decide here tonight we're going to bring back, you know, busing to uh, 1.7 miles instead of 1 point or 2.0 that it is right now. Um, but I think we can actually say that where kids cannot safely walk to school, because of a primary or secondary road barrier, I think we can say that tonight. Uh, and that's my, what I'm going to advocate among my board members here tonight. What's it going to cost? I don't know. Um, if we're going to bring back busing, I think what's going to be required. I think that was filling in my tooth, except that thing. I have three fillings, I guess. Um, but uh, I, I think that what would have to be done to make a intelligent restoration of busing will, will, will take weeks of analysis. It will require a survey of the community where we identify the, the categories of, of need and not necessarily tied to an absolute of two miles um, and, and no high school busing, for example. Um, social media, like I said, it, it, it's, it's a questionable value, but you do see things on there. And I did see something uh, today or yesterday or whatever where the parent was talking about, okay, my middle schooler gets bused, but my high schooler that lives in the same house doesn't. Now, it could be a capacity issue, right? The buses are full, and we've said we can only bus, you know, uh, in K-8, and the high schooler is filled the bus up. So yeah, we're not going to, or we don't mix. And I don't know that. I don't have that level of insight how busing is conducted. We don't mix. We don't perhaps mix kids on the bus. And then that obviously is a complication. So what I would advocate to the administration, uh, to my board members, is that we make some commitment to restoring busing. Uh, the amount of money. That's not necessarily what we need to to agree to here tonight because it's uncertain as to what that would be. We need to do a survey of the community and really understand what the community's needs are, not what their wants are or convenience that, you know, mom or dad get to sleep in because the bus is picking the kid up. No, that's not going to really float. But if you have a compelling need and certainly something that's based upon safety, then we need to know about it. And there needs to be an extensive analysis done. And in the end, see, this can affect school start times. So it's not a simple decision. It's very, very complicated. Um, but. The reality of it is, if the levy passes, when you look ahead to 2024, 2025, there is a sufficient surplus of funds by which you could bring back some level of busing. Um, again, if it was, you know, even if it's heyday, it's $250,000 a year, 
you bring that back for so you make it make it easy math here, that's, that's you know million million dollars over four years. Uh, but we're not going to do that. That much is not needed by any means. But if we did, if you look ahead, if the levy passes, we have more money than that, you know, as a surplus if the levy passes, and that's the big thing. If it doesn't, forget it. You know, we are where we are. Um, but um, that's my point. Uh, again, the district cannot say, you know, yes, you're going to get this back tonight, and it's, it's a very complex thing. But I would turn to my fellow school board members and say, we have to make some commitment the restoration of busing where it makes sense. And I can think of no better example as to where it's needed and what Cassie brought up to us tonight. And um, we have to consider that. So um, let's see here. Keep in mind that the real purpose of the levy is to save off a fiscal deficit of currently seven and a half million dollars in 2025. Um, that said, if the levy passes, there is some surplus above the amount to keep us out of that deficit that will allow the restoration of some things, like we, like we decided at the last school board meeting. That was not a what if, that was a reality. That's what is coming back. It's not a hollow promise or a maybe. You know, you're seeing K-5 STEM come back, you're seeing uh, the librarians go back to full time, and you're seeing the 31 supplementals come back. So there's some cost for that, okay? some hundreds of thousands or whatever it is cost. Um, but the bulk of what that levy is intended for is to head off of a $7.5 million deficit we're looking at in 2025. So anyhow, the, let's say if we did 50000 on busing or 100, and I'm not going to by any means try to get the school district to agree to any amount tonight. It has to be based upon need and a compelling observation of, of what is required to provide safety and, and an important service to our community. But anyhow, I'll open up for discussion to fellow board members here on what your thoughts are. Obviously, I'm one person, um, but I think we have to bring back, to commit to some level of busing restoration. We just have to do it smartly and consistent with what our budget will allow. But again, we have sufficient funding to provide some level of busing restoration, and we just need to figure out what that is. You want to do that now, or do we want to finish open communication? Just communication, and then we have an opportunity to address topics for general discussion near the end of our agenda. So let's let's plan to put that on for discussion then, and I'll make a note to make sure we talk about it. All right. We still have one more person for open communication. That's David Buckalo. David? Before, when I was more active on some of the boards, the special needs, I would have some parents reach out to me. And I wasn't anything, I was just outspoken. And each time they did, I reached out to you. And you would take a name and a phone number, and you would call the people. I never bothered you with follow-up to see what happened or what you did or anything. I just trusted them. But I would ask the parents how did things turn out. And they were always very happy. And I always thought very highly of you for doing that because you went beyond the rhetoric and actually helped people. And it's, I give you halos for that. Speaking of special ed, I understand the school is considering hiring a special ed director. If you do that, I'm asking that you do not repeat the mistakes of the past, that you have a parent group and the parents should be brought in to the interview process and decision-making process to where they have more than just a voice, more than just an opinion, but whether they say yes or no means something significant. The other thing is, because it's that group 
that there needs to be some accountability to. The other thing is that the um, special needs, I hope, and I do mean this, do not offer multi-year contracts to where you're locked into a person. Because if the person's not performing the way the community wants them to, and then the answer comes back in private conversations that we know we got a big problem here, but there's nothing we can do about for the next four years. It's not fair to the students, it's not fair to the community. You should be, if you're going to do a contract, you do a one year contract, it's renewed. If someone says, I'm not willing to work under that condition, that's fine, but somebody else will. And if their work is solid, they should be very comfortable with them. Okay, that's, that, that's it, because the stakes are, stakes are too high. Next thing I'm going to talk about, I don't know how I'm doing on time, but is the campaign. And I'm not here to set a force fight. But I know how the opinions in this room run, or I can guess pretty easily how they run. The campaigning is dirty. But when I say that, everybody is probably thinking it's dirty on one side, not dirty on one side. You have a pack that I don't think plays fair, and then you have surrogates. They hide behind false Facebook pages, false profiles. They've even been sending out emails under other people's names. So it would be like if I were to send an email out and it looked like it came from you. That's totally unacceptable. And it degrades. And people blame the schools. They don't blame them because they're anonymous. They're hiding. And it comes back and it just erodes your credibility. And I cannot, you know, I don't know how this election is going to turn out. It's a 50-50 deal. And I, I feel that way about all issue campaign. If you win it, you lose it. But right now, you know, if you lose this one, you really have to do some rethinking about the approach, because the approach you have isn't working. And you have to respect, you may not like what the voters say, but you got to respect the voters. I guess that's it. I hope you get control over all of these people. You know, my image of them is that they're sitting in a bedroom someplace and they're sniffering and ha 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 and all of that. And every time they do that, and and that may be emotionally satisfying to some of the people in this room. Because you, know, you see it and say, well, you know, one for the cost. But every time they do that, they're doing it at your expense. And if you're a teacher or a staff member, or a board member, and you want that levy to pass, they're not helping you. They're hurting you. Send in my speech, and hopefully I won't be back for another 12 months. Thank you very much. You're welcome. With your comments, I just have one small comment. You said we have a PAC, and that's not correct. The school board does not have a political action committee. So. I'm not saying it is. I don't care about the perception. The reality is the school board does not have a political action committee. I was told by Mr. and Mrs. Presno early on that they were asked by, uh, I, I'm not throwing those stones. I don't do that. I would have done that earlier. But they were asked by the superintendent to head up the PAC. And I've worked on PAC. I know how they run. Um, I know they're supposed to be kept separate. But Perception goes down, and I don't. Yeah, you just gotta. We need to up there. That's, that's all. Thank you, sir. All right, that is all of our uh, open communication speakers for this evening. Uh, going now to the uh, superintendent's report. Uh, last month, um, we talked about the last couple months about consent agenda, and last month we agreed that we would begin using the consent agenda for um, uh, the typical components of our, um, our regular meeting. And so that includes the superintendent's report for certified uh, licensed employment resignation leave of absence uh, and supplemental duties for both certified uh, employees and support staff employees. So that is items 
A and E A and E B. Uh, is there is there any items on the on those two A A or A B that board members would like to have uh, pulled out and addressed separately? Hearing, hearing and seeing, no, no response. Then, um, do we have a motion to uh, approve the superintendent's report for 8A and 8B? Mrs. Dorn, is there a second? Mr. Price, is there any discussion or comments? All right, Mr. Lyman, please call the roll. Mrs. Long? Yes. Mr. Price? Yes. Mrs. Slothman? Yes. Mr. Carpenter? Yes. Mrs. Dorn? Yes. Motion passes for 8A and 8B. Dr. Kozad, would you like to continue with item 8C? Yep. Uh, C, summer camps recommend approval of the following 2021 summer athletic camps. Youth volleyball camp, youth cheer camp, baseball camp, youth softball, youth girls basketball, youth boys basketball, and youth cross country. So obviously last year all these were canceled, um, and these were all go under COVID protocols as, as per those protocols at that time. So I get a motion. This is wrong. This is not a second. Oh, questions or comments? I heard I'm very happy to see these on here. Yes. I was, yes, this is needed. Yes. Anybody else? Questions, comments? All right, Mr. Lonnie, please call the roll. Mr. Price? Yes. Mrs. Slothman? Yes. Mr. Carpenter? Yes. Mrs. Dorn? Yes. Mrs. Long? Yes. Motion passes. Our D, purchase of a school bus, recommend adopt, adoption of the following resolution for the purchase of one school bus, whereas the Belbrook Shrew Creek Local Board of Education wishes to advertise and receive bids for the purchase of one school bus. Therefore, be resolved that Belbrook Shrew Creek Local Board of Education wishes to participate and authorize the Southwestern Ohio Purchasing Council to advertise and receive bids on the board's behalf as per the specification submitted by the cooperative purchase of one school bus. We have a motion. Mrs. Long? Mrs. Lauren? So this is a special needs school bus that we'll be purchasing and we also have a grant from the state of Ohio that expires at the end of this fiscal year for about $25,000, $26,000. Um, the state of Ohio authorizes this grant based on percent funding. So again, our funding from the state is about 26-27%. And that's about how much we get of that is 26, 27 percent. Um, and we purchased it through um, the EPC, so um, they do all the bidding for us um, for for our school buses. So, uh, but it is a special needs school bus. And this is a use it or lose it scenario as far as that grant. As far as the grant. grant. So again, the, the school bus has a lift on the back, um, and our, our current buses are showing some aging aging for. Um, students with disabilities um, for that specific school bus. Okay. Dr. President, is this a small special needs bus or is this a regular bus equipped with a wheelchair? Lift? Full size with uh, the lift. Yeah, we have no, all of our buses are the full. So this length. Won't, it won't be ex exclusive to special needs students. It'll be, this is a. No. This no. Is, definitely a lot of times we. Our aging fleet problem. Yeah, definitely we right. put those together. And then also, um, the, the rest of the funds are, are purchased out of our permanent improvement funds. So this is not coming out of general funds, it's coming out of our permanent improvement funds. Other questions or comments? And Mr. Lyman, it's been two years since we purchased a school bus, or three? Is it been summer 2018? I think 2018. I was going to say two, but it might be three. I don't okay, know. Two. Okay, two years ago. So right. We didn't do any purchasing last year, year before. Okay. 
and with the number of buses we have, if uh, we want to, you know, if ideally if we wanted to have buses that we purchase new whenever we got to the uh, age that the state says we should, we'd have to buy about two buses a year to stay on that schedule. And is the grant limited to a uh, certain percent of just one bus, or? It's $26,000 regardless of if we get one bus or 10 oh. buses or 20 buses. Okay. That's what we get is $26,000. Okay. Yep. One flat amount. One flat amount. Right? Yep. Yep. So if we purchase, yeah. If it's 26 or we purchase yeah, so one bus or, or five right? buses, yeah. right. No. It's, it's 26 or okay. 27, somewhere in that range. Okay. Regardless. Yep. Question. All right. Any other questions or comments? All right, Mr. Lyman, please call the roll. Mrs. Slaughter? Yes. Mr. Carpenter? Yes. Mrs. Dorn? Yes. Mrs. Long? Yes. Mr. Price? Yes. Motion passes. East School Resource Officer, um, recommend approval of agreement with the Sugar Creek Township for school resource officers for the 2021-22 school year and no, char no change from the 2021 contract. Do we have a motion? Mrs. Dorn? Mrs. Slaughter? Second? Any questions or comments? Which, um, this is, applies to all the schools? This is, uh, this is middle school and high school. Those are our two uh, schools that are in the township. So Officer Terry is currently assigned to us. Um, and then uh, we also have an agreement with Bellbrook, City of Bellbrook for Stephen Bell and uh, BCI. Yep. So even though BCI is right next to, you know, it's out there. The it's city and Bellbrook. township line yeah. goes between the buildings. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right there. Again, all of them do a fantastic job, so we're really appreciative of all the services they provide to us and support they provide to us. All right. Any other questions or comments? All right. Please call the roll. Mr. Carpenter? Yes. Mrs. Dorn? Yes. Mrs. Long? Yes. Mr. Price? Yes. Mrs. Slough? Yes. Motion passes. F, out-of-state travel, recommend approval for the following out-of-state travel. So the high school band to Indianapolis, Indiana in November of 2021. Eighth graders to Washington, D.C. in May of 2022. Senior music students uh, in May of 2022. High school classes of 25 and 26 to D.C. That's May 31st to June 3rd. And high school marching band to Orlando, Florida, uh, December of 22 to January of 23. All right, do we have a motion? Mrs. Long? Second? Mrs. Doran? And this may be like some of our own personal vacation plans. We got, you know, we didn't do anything for a year. Maybe we're going to do a little extra over the next six months, a year, a year. So um, the, the November 1 in 2021, they are not staying overnight. The marching band is not. But the eighth graders, that's the traditional eighth grade trip to D.C. So that's the end of next school year. The senior music, end of next year, traditional. This is what's different here. So the DC trip for classes 25 and 26. So this is the current year freshmen, current year eighth graders that didn't get, get to go last year, aren't going to go this year. So planning for actually after school is out um, for next year. And we have a few high school teachers that are taking that over. Mr. Caldwell, Mr. Fromm, and um, Mr. Phelps are graciously taking that over for the high school since those students are high school now. And then the marching band, 22, 20 period. Again, hopefully we're, we're past some level of COVID that we can do traveling. So obviously all these are, are contingent on those things. But again, you've got to plan well in advance of these things. Um, and hopefully, you know, fingers crossed that they're going to be able to make these trips. We can get back to some type of normalcy, much like this, the youth camps in the summer. Mm -hmm. any, other, any questions or comments? My question would be regarding the eighth grade trip. That time period, like if that were this year, that would like include the last day of school. Are we certain that that will be during school next year? Number three or number four? Uh, number two. two. Oh, number two? Um, because we have been getting out around that week. Yeah, that's during school. I haven't looked ahead, and I should have put a seating. It's during school. 
Okay. So the, only one that is not, the only one that's not during school is number four. It's after school is out. And number five is during winter break. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm tracking now because that's the end. We've already heard of that. Sorry, I was jumping ahead. I was, I was off a year. Okay. We're good. We have that calendar already approved. Okay. Yeah. okay. Good. Thank you. Yep. All right. Any other questions or comments? All right, Mr. Lyman, please call the roll. Mrs. Dorn? Yeah. Mrs. Long? Yeah. Mr. Price? Yeah. Mrs. Slaughter? Yeah. Mr. Carpenter? Yes. Motion passes. All right. Uh, donations recommend acceptance of the following donations with gratitude. Um, anonymous uh, for $15,000 cash donation. And Elijah and Brittany Etienne, I think is how you say that. Is that somewhat close? Yeah. Two skids of water bottles for Steve Bell Elementary, 3,800 total water bottles. <laughs> have, a, have a motion? Three? That's a motion? Okay. It's okay. Motion. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. So again, obviously both of those are very generous donations. And again, the $15,000 cash donation, we are working towards doing something. We have not yet figured out 100% what we're going to do with that, but we're working to doing something really great with that. So we really appreciate both of these donations. That's amazing that somebody, yes. you know, that, that's not some change, you know, so gratitude. And the bottles as well, right? But yeah. uh, it just, I think it's kind of like special, <laughs> Special notice there with 15,000, and that's, that's amazing. Somebody could do that. So. Yeah, very appreciate Thank you for the that. water bottles, too. Appreciate it. Okay, Mrs. Long? Yeah. Mr. Price? Yes. Mrs. Slothman? Mr. Carpenter? Yeah. Mrs. Dorn? Yeah. Motion passes. All right, eighth revisions to board policy. Recommend approval of the following revisions to the Board of Education policy. And I'm going to read every one of these. No, I'm not. You can look at them <laughs> on here. Oops, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yes, I know. Do we have a motion? Mrs. Softman? Mrs. Dorn? Any questions or comments? Did you get any feedback? prior to our meeting from any board members for corrections? Not specific kind of things, no. Okay. Again, most of them were, I'll say wordsmithing, but corrections aligning our stuff with federal policies, federal uh, rules, laws, regulations. Right. Here's and an example. Revisions. One of them said videotapes, and they changed it to videos. So, uh, yeah, kind of like dated policy with old vernacular we no longer use. So. Yeah. Uh, mostly happy to glad stuff, uh, you know, changing from work days to days, you know, things like that. You know, you know, near, through my perusal, there was no, nothing substantive there um, as yet, so. All right, let's call the roll. Okay, Mr. Price? Yes. Mrs. Slaughman? Yes. Mr. Carpenter? Yes. Mrs. Dorn? Yes. And Mrs. Long? Yes. Motion passed. All right, um, I have the information board member comments. So graduation for the class of 2021 on Saturday on May 15th. Do we know uh, yet where and what time? We are trending strongly to the stadium. Okay. We're the trend, we're trending strongly to there. Um, again, getting a few more students, few more uh, guests for each student. Um, being outside obviously would be extremely beneficial. But we're, we're hopefully have a decision within the next week or so. Nice. So that's where the trend is going. All right, a comment uh, to talk about the return of busing. Mr. Kirsch, do you want to open that up? Well, again, I think the case for some return of, of busing, the case for some return of busing is compelling. Um, Again, based on my experience of jogging by BCI the other day and seeing an L-shape going out the feed wire 20 minutes before the school's even uh, let out. Um, again, the well-crafted, well-conveyed 
uh, situation tonight of something I had never heard of, never thought of, I guess I should say, uh, of, of students essentially being having real barriers, either through primary or secondary roads, to where it's, it's an impossibility for them to walk. Um, I think, no doubt, when that state plan was crafted, or state law was crafted for the two miles for, for busing requirement, it was, it was predicated upon some assumption of what is a reasonable distance for people to walk or bike to school. Um, the state doesn't take it so far as to say, hey, is it, is it safe? They haven't done that. But that doesn't mean we can as a district do that. And that was the case again in Utah for us. Um, it was, it, it, it was not state law that they had to bus my kids across a four-lane highway. But the district saw that as a need, as a, an essential uh, thing to do, and they did. Um, and we were greatly appreciative of that. So. Um, when you look ahead in our five-year budget, if, let me underscore that, if and only if the levy passes, there is additional money available that could be used towards busing. Busing in its heyday was 250000 We don't need to go back to that. It's somewhere between zero and that, and it's probably you know, much, much closer to the zero than the, the 250. But so I, by no means a committal tonight of any amount of funding but I believe that we as a board need to commit to some level of busing restoration. It needs, though, to be based upon a survey of the community. That the parents need to respond. There needs to be a well-crafted survey that says, okay, what's your situation? And then we need to make this a decision, or the administration does ultimately, on, on if we are to restore busing, you know, where is it really needed versus liked and wanted? You know, it needs to be a compelling, compelling reason. Again, an example. One was, you know, in the same household, a middle school student gets bust and a high school student doesn't. You know, that's that's probably not, it's kind of hard to understand, unless, again, the bus is full or, showing my lack of intimate knowledge with this, if we just don't mix high school students with middle school students in the same bus or something like that. So, anyway, I'll just say this. I think, as a board, we need to you know, express our interest that a commitment of some level of busing restoration and we need to do it smartly. It, it's going to be a multi-week, if not month, process to figure out how to do it. But again, it's all predicated upon levy passage. If it doesn't, then it's, it's, a, neat, it's a neat discussion and we're done. So, uh, anyway, so I'll hush now and let you all talk and see what your thoughts are. Um, I know that we have looked at busing uh, from a distance from the school basis. Does the law require that, or can we determine other parameters and say, okay, we you know, even if it's a, a, a mile and a half, but they have good sidewalks all the way to the school, so we won't bus in that neighborhood, but, you know, here's another uh, neighborhood that's only a mile away, but they don't have safe uh, safe sidewalks, we could we would bus there. So I don't know whether the regulations indicate that we have to be based on just distance, or can we also take into consideration the nuances of our, of our community and the, the safety or non-safety of the, uh, the walking routes uh, to school? Yeah, I mean, we can take, up, take those into consideration. That's, you know, you look at our ineligibility zones, they're not, they're not walking zones, they're ineligibility transportation zones. If you look at it, it's not drawn like a circle, just because once you go into a platter neighborhood, you really have to get everybody in there because you're going to be sure. driving past people's houses. So, um, so that's the challenge. Is you know, part of the neighborhood might be if you want to say 1.5, part of the neighborhood might be a 1.3, the other 1.7. Well, once you go in there, sure. you've got to essentially pick everybody up. But we right. have that ability to do that. Yes. Okay. So, that's for example, the the McBee Road that's uh, 1.9 miles away. Um, we could, we could still say because of the condition of the, the route, we could choose that uh, over something else that might right. <clears throat> might actually be two miles, but it's a, right. it's a safe journey the whole way. So K-8 outside of two miles, we have to transport anything inside two miles for K-8. We have the option to do that or not. Mm -hmm. We have the ability to customize that for our district. Well, I, I'm certainly in favor of looking at what uh, what our options could be if the levy would pass, particularly by focusing on what safe travel as compared to just distance. Uh, and that's my perspective. I mean, 
I, other, other thoughts? I, I agree I'm in favor of looking at it. I am I think it's premature to commit to restoring any particular amount of busing this evening. I very much appreciate you coming out here. Like I said, you are the first person who has approached me in any way regarding busing. I do know it was an issue. I do know it's an issue for my own family and it well it, it currently is it, but as soon as we hit high school it will be an issue for my family um, as we are working parents. Um, that said, I do know that this amount of money you would likely be talking about is of a particular amount that I don't think I can say tonight is the highest priority. Um, I don't know that um, restoring busing, whether it was $10,000 or $100,000, would necessarily trump restoring a teacher to a particular grade level classroom. Um, or, or a number of other things that we have lost throughout mm -hmm. this process. Um, and I would want to offer the opportunity before we make a commitment tonight to restore something, um, I would want to look at all of the other things that might be priorities. Okay. Additionally, there's a, a good segment of this community who does not think we should be spending any additional money, period. And um, even if this levy passes, we need to be very cognizant that we don't want to go through this again for a very long time. Mm -hmm. So I think all of these wants um, that I definitely, as a board member, but also as a parent, want to restore everything uh, that I possibly could. Mm -hmm. Um, this community also does not want to go through this process anytime soon. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that that's weighing heavily on my mind. It's definitely something I want to look at, Kevin. It's definitely something if for a relatively minor amount of money we can make a big, big impact, particularly when it comes to um, student safety, uh, it, like you spoke about tonight. Definitely want to take a look at it, but it's not something I'm ready to commit to doing this evening. Any other thoughts or comments? Roger, thank you. Those are really well, well made, well taken points that you made there. Um, but I would respond with respect. Okay, we're going to bring back nine through twelve busing. That gets complicated. Are we going to address the situation of? middle school and high school student being in the same same uh, household and busing both of them instead of the other just one it's complicated right it, it, it's like it, it's like a chess three-dimensional chess game you know because we it might affect school start times and everything else how many bus drivers and how many buses and it is very complicated um, that said I cannot think of any reason why we cannot come to an agreement that a situation like was brought up to us tonight is not something we can address um, because it will cost us something. It's not going to cost us $250,000 a year. It's not going to cost us nothing. It's going to be somewhere in between, uh, I don't know, some tens of thousands of dollars, whatever that would happen to be. I don't know what it would be. But, uh, but that one to me is objectively uh, justified, you know, that we could say, some level of busing needs to be restored. We have a budget for that. And what I'm saying is, yeah, we yeah, look at the five-year plan, you know, and if the levy passes, we're going to have some money in the bank above the 10% that the state recommends for our, um, for our cost, for the, for the cash on hand uh, up through 2024 at least, and maybe even 2025. I'd have to go look and get that again. But uh, we're not talking a huge impact in terms of the budget. Uh, for what I think is a, is a huge return. Um, and uh, again, I can't think of a reason to not be in favor of you know, essentially commit to some. What I would say is tonight, I think we should commit to some level of busing restoration. What that is would be based upon a survey from the community. But as a minimum, we would address this situation where we've got kids living in places where they cannot walk. They have to cross a primary or secondary road to get to the school, and then that forces the parents absolutely without any choice uh, or option to, uh, to take their kids to school. That's my 
point. I'm one person on the board. I understand that. So uh, obviously, people will offer your opinions. I hear you. I also do know that we have another board meeting prior to the levy. So I do think there is time. I don't know that um, that the, if the situation is limited to the areas we're talking about. I don't know the number of students we're talking about. This could be significant. I, I don't know. But this could be riding a whole nother bus full of kids. It could be two buses full of kids. I don't, I don't know what the, that impact is. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many students live in these areas. I don't know if there are more areas we're talking about. I suspect that um, we start talking about this tonight, we're going to have a lot of other people raising their hands saying, my area is not walkable and neither is mine, and, and that's good. And we want to hear that feedback, Right. but I, again, we might be talking about a minor amount of money, we might be talking about a very significant amount of money. If we're talking significant, I think we need a very serious conversation as to is it something we want to do or do we need to reserve finances in any way we can, and if it, alternatively, we have a significant amount of money, is there something that out prioritizes blessing that we need to do with that significant amount of money? Mm -hmm. point, we, have, we have another meeting, you know, April 22nd, I think it is, right? So, mm -hmm. so uh, with some time to give thought to this, so uh, I take back my thing, we should commit tonight to uh, to uh, some restoration of, of, of uh, busing. I think we should give some serious thought to it between now and the meeting on the 22nd. Um, but that's that the point. You know, I appreciate your point, Audrana. Thank you. Any other thoughts? Yeah, I want to add to this. So we lost blessing, and it is detrimental in the sense my husband had to switch his job around to how he could be there to run somebody to BCI and then be home to get somebody else on the bus, Stephen Bell. Next year, we'll lose busing completely. And where we live, gosh, a mile and a half from BCI, we're not comfortable with our kids walking that far, and we do have sidewalks. So you're in a different situation because I know where McBee is. I would never let my kids walk on there. I wouldn't walk on there. But we did lose busing. Um, so this is really going to affect us who've lost busing. If you haven't had to go through it, and rearrange your job and your schedule and when you get up and how you do things, it doesn't seem as urgent as to us who live this every day because we get the seven-year-old on the bus at 824 and have to be there to pick him up at 255. I'm not sure about you guys, but my job is longer than that. Like it really affects every aspect. Mm -hmm. um, so I appreciate you bringing it up. It is, it affects a lot of things. I don't have the safety issues as much. Um, so I can't imagine what that's like, but thank you for bringing it up. The safety issues you mentioned have bothered me for quite a while. I want you to know that. I am not sure what we can do. And I know it's not a comfort to you to know this, but we will be talking about it. Thank you for bringing it up. Anything else? Dave, I have another thing here. Um, we begin each school board meeting with the following statement. This meeting is a meeting of the Board of Education in public for the purpose of conducting the school district's business and is not to be considered a public meeting. When I sat in the audience before I was on the board, and now as I sit up there on the board, every time that statement's read, the question that comes into my mind is, when is the community meeting? We have to have an opportunity to, for the community to speak to us and for us to have a true back and forth with them. Um, we, we normally, we give them three minutes, there's nil to none, we're back and forth with that person. Um, and so I think that's not healthy. I think we need to communicate with the community in an open forum, at least yearly, maybe semi, twice a year, maybe quarterly, I don't know. But the fact that we cannot have an open discussion with the community is unacceptable, in my opinion. Um, so what I would like to offer up for consideration, this needs to be a board discussion here right now. Uh, the closest thing we had to a community meeting, I believe, was February of last year, just prior to COVID 
take an end. The purpose of that meeting was to provide a factual discussion of a levy that we had on the ballot in March. And then, of course, after that, COVID arrived and, um, you know, uh, et cetera. So it's been immensely complicated um, to have even think about a type of community uh, involvement. Now, we, and we have an opportunity at board meetings. We've allowed people virtually to communicate with us. Very few people have taken advantage of it. Um, but that meeting in February of last year, if I recall, in fact, I do recall, there, I didn't count them, but there were probably 100 to 200 people there. Um, it was mediated in that case because it was a contentious issue and remains a contentious issue in our community. It was mediated by the Dayton Mediation Center. It was conducted properly and civilly. At some point, we're going to get past issues in our community that are contentious. And then we could just talk about, well, hey, have you thought about this for curriculum? Have you thought about this for adding a bowling team, for example, or uh, pick one? You know, or we just advertise on the stage with the po with kids that do poetry or, or, or plays or whatever, and then at the end we have a Q&A with the community. You know, we need to get to that. Um, but in the near term, I think we need to discuss here tonight, the levy's coming up uh, here on what, May 4th. Um, people have questions. I don't do not see why we could not or should not have an informational session on the levy where it's a community meeting um, that provides facts about the upcoming levy. The community, community will be able to ask questions as they did last year through the Dayton Mediation Center because this is a particularly difficult subject to discuss. But the avenues by which we attempt to reach out to the community to provide them from the board factual information about the levy, it's challenging. How many people do we have show up at a board meeting? Almost none. If you go take a look at how many people watch it via YouTube, it's anywhere from 90 to 100. Um, we have there have been the uh, meet the superintendent meetings, three or four people show up. But again, when I look back February of last year, we had between 100 and 200 people show up in public. So um, this year, of course, we'd be constrained still with COVID. COVID would still be uh, a limit, limiting factor there. Let me just say like it is, I would think it would be in the community's best interest for us to have an informational session on the levy sometime between now and you know late April. Um, it provides the community an opportunity to be educated about the nature of the levy and to ask questions. And with having a mediation group, we can avoid the contentiousness that can, you know, can be uh, involved in discussions like that. So that's my suggestion, my recommendation that we have a public meeting community meeting sometime over the next two to three weeks. Thank you. I just want to, to let people know that there are going to be two tailgate talks, which are coffee with the superintendent, COVID safe, on April 20th and 28th. So from 9 to 10 a.m. at BCI on the 20th, 28th, 6 to 7 p.m. at BCI. So again, those, those would be opportunities that people can come we can talk about the levy, we can talk about whatever else is on people's minds in a close, not too close, COVID close, uh, intimate environment there where it's um, out in front of BCI there. And hopefully those two days are going to be nice two days. Um, if not, we will move inside to the BCI lobby, uh, gym lobby right there. So there are a couple opportunities for people to come and ask questions. Um, to myself, Mr. Liming, and one board member will be at each one of those. Other thoughts? Kevin, I 100% agree with you regarding the statement and the need for a regular tempo of community forum. Um, I felt the same when I was sitting in these seats. Aside from standing up for three minutes and then sitting back down, I wanted to discuss, and I wanted to hear board members discuss um, their views on things, right? Because I didn't really know, you know, how you know you thought differently than you, for example. Um, so no, I 100% agree that we need to set that up as a as a, a tempo. To throw in another topic, I would like to see one this summer. I know decisions are already being discussed regarding our back-to-school COVID plan. 
I think the community does need to have a dedicated forum to let their wishes be heard. There are some big decisions that are going to need to be made, and I don't think that needs to happen very soon because I think we need to figure out what COVID's going to look like come late July or August. Mm -hmm. But I do think people, parents want to be heard regarding how our kids go to school next year, um, regarding distances, regarding quarantines, regarding masks, regarding online or in person. Um, I think we need to give people that um, opportunity because I want to know. I, I want to know what I know what I think as a parent. I want to know what other parents think. I want to know what our teachers think. I want to know what our administrators think. Um, regarding the levy, I'm wondering, sometimes when we have these a big, we try to have a big forum, it becomes an opportunity to grandstand and it becomes contentious. This is a student from the hip. What do you think if um, we had a forum where we were all present, but so Be fine, open meetings. I don't know. Um, because I'm not certain how feasible it would be to, to pull off a a large community forum um, like you were talking about, Kevin. I'm not saying it's impossible, but if it's not possible, um, I would remember being find as many of you as are available mm -hmm. to separately gather and respond to community members' questions, for sure. I think my thoughts on the order, again, it's creative thinking and it's uh, Great, but I guess what I'm thinking is that there are there are objective facts surrounding the levy that is probably difficult for all of us to be fully knowledgeable of and conversant in, and so there are absolute facts associated with it that you know regardless of pro con or neutral or un uncertain that can, can and should be conveyed and understood by the community. Ohio school funding is extremely complex extremely complex and, uh, and the whole nature of levies inside outside millage house bill 920 blah 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 it's all extremely complex and not that we're going to make anybody an expert on it if, if we were to have a factual meeting on the levy but at least there's an opportunity for them to hear it in an organized fashion you know here is your here's the facts of the levy you know why the community why the district comes back and clearing the four levies etc whatever Fact-based. I'm afraid if if we just spread out in the parking lot and, and, and five people stand around you and start asking questions ad hoc without some structure to the discussion, I'm not sure how effective that would be. My opinion. So uh, I think it, it would be beneficial for the community to hear an organized presentation, just like they did last year. I didn't think it was problematic last year, last February. I don't have any recollection of any negative on either side of house it was well conducted questions were asked questions were answered um, I thought it was productive um, that's my I don't have any way to really measure that you know as far as how it helped what ultimately was to the community what I'm certain of and convinced of beyond any question is that there is a lot of cloud floating over people clouds floating over people's heads with respect to this levy still and I think it's a constant effort to try to educate the community and different things work for different people. It may be a direct call to Dr. Kozad for some people. Uh, it may be the three or four people that show up historically at a, at a coffee with the superintendent to really benefit from that. Um, I think the biggest bang for the buck is an opportunity where you have a public presentation where that is the focus. Although we've had focuses here or mentions of it with some explanation, certainly at some of our board meetings, but it's buried in a board meeting. So you don't have a lot of people tuning in for for board information, or our site for levy information. So, anyway, this needs to be a consensus. My opinion is we should have an informational session uh, between now and uh, May 4th. Uh, but obviously, I'm just talking my opinion. So, um, but I appreciate your thoughts. So that in the future, at least, we need to have better communication with the community, or, or a forum for open communication with the community outside of our current three three limit 
three minute construct and limitation for import units. So, I don't know what the rest of you always think about it, uh, the informational meeting, but about the levy before May 4th. I'll just push up and off. If there's anything other comments about it. One of the things that I've observed over the last couple of years is um, certainly when we first had the uh, levy come out, there was a fair amount of contentious discussion, in which case, for the first time in my recollection as a board member, we did limit people to three minutes. Um, this evening, there was no time limit. There was, you know, there was uh, some back and forth dialogue with individuals, which is what historically was the norm. So if somebody came and wanted to chat, we had a little bit of dialogue back and forth, not excessive, but some. And um, it was all really very civil and um, very problem solving in, in its nature. Um, I think we had some experience from a couple of years ago where um, the intention of some of the speakers was to attack um, and not just, not just share their concerns or or their perspective or simple recommendations and things like that. Um, I have a fair amount of leeway as the presiding officer to be able to extend the time that a person speaks, not count, you know, not measure the time. Um, really, that the guide rails are there so that um, it doesn't take over the, take over the meeting. Uh, make it impossible for us to do our business as a board. But um, to, to the extent that we can uh, allow and uh, accommodate people's perspectives and sharing their concerns, um, I like to do that. Um, and so I have a fair amount of, of leeway to be able to do that as the presiding officer, not because it's me, but because it's the presiding officer's responsibility and opportunity. So I'm not saying that we shouldn't have uh, uh, a specific time for people to be able to come and and, and be chat, because I think that that would be I think that could be very beneficial. Um, that people shouldn't feel uncomfortable about coming and doing that at a board meeting. Really, it's just a different day, a different time. So, um, so that's my perspective. On that, I, I'm not opposed to having it, but I think that um, the opportunity for people is there, and um, I would encourage people to take advantage of it. So. Other thoughts? Um, okay. So the conclusion is that we're not. Agreeing to have an informational meeting between now and the end of May, that, that's I'm, what we need to nail down here. I'm not so. hearing from folks that we want to. I'm not hearing that we don't. But, so I'd like to hear about the feasibility of that. And I think I'm looking at you, Mr. Lanning. I, I mean, a lot of that is going to fall to you because you are the keeper of the fact, for the most part. I'll try. Could you drop your mask? I can't Sorry. understand you. Could you drop your mask when you talk? I can't understand. I think I'd like to hear about the feasibility of having something like that. I know a lot of that will fall to, uh, we're talking about presenting factual information. A lot of that is going to be data and numbers. Um, I know that the last time that happened, that was largely felt to you. And I don't know if the timeline is sufficient that I'd like to hear your thoughts. Sure, just from my perspective, if, if someone has a question about the levy, um, we have two, two in-person opportunities on the 20th and 28th that we can give a general overview of what the levy is about, and we can have a Q&A back and forth, conversation back and forth, if people have specific questions. We also have Bridge that is coming out um, in the next few days here that has important financial facts about the district. Um, has all, also has a quality profile from the 2019-20 school year, so in COVID time, I know it's a little, a little late, but 
2019-20 quality profile of all the great stuff that, that we've done showcasing our schools, but in there is also financial facts and information. And so I'm just, from my perspective, people have questions about the levy or financial facts. They can reach out to me, they can reach out to Mr. Liming. Um, we have you know, our own email addresses. We have our info at bss.k12.oh.us. That's plastered all over the place in the bridge. If people have specific questions, you know, a couple weeks ago, I had a couple of people that uh, I had a conversation with, um, and I, I don't know if I gave them the information that they exactly were looking for, but it was, it was an okay conversation. Um, so I guess just from looking from my perspective, there's two in-person opportunities that we can have that people can get their answers about the levy. But if the board wants me to do something else, then that's the board's will, I will do that. I acknowledge the complexity with trying to do something like this. For one, we haven't talked about it until now. And again, COVID, we can blame for everything, right? And we should, because it, it's, it's truly been a real problem for us. Um, and I understand the complexity of having a big group meeting. Um, but even if, you know, we could probably fit, we have here tonight, probably, uh, I don't know, what is it, 40 chairs in here. You know, we could probably and you know, put 80 or 100 people in here, even tonight. So I think there, there's room for at least some level of that. Um, but again, I acknowledge the complexity and the difficulty trying to do it. I, I recognize what you're saying, that there are other things being done. I just know historically I've been to at least one or two of the uh, meetings you've done. I've been the one board member that came to some of your meetings, and two or three people show up. Uh, if there's a crowd, people tend to gather, you know, if there's an event. Um, you know, tonight you mentioned that, hey, I'm going to be having this, but my guess is, you know, probably the people that are watching are not really going to spread the word that you have these opportunities coming. Nearby Beaver Creek, as I understand it, has been doing some public uh, presentations to their community. Uh, I don't have any details about it. I just saw some references to it or whatever. But, um, again, I think aside from COVID, I think it would be essential we would do it. Uh, in light of COVID, I'm not as convinced that it's beneficial or practical, I guess maybe is a better way of saying it. Um, but I think it's unfortunate that if we can't really have a forum in public where we present factual data, where people can ask questions in a controlled manner as facilitated by something like the Dayton Mediation Center. Um, so those are my thoughts. Uh, it's, ideally, that's what I would like to see. Uh, it's by no means a demand. It's a, it's a how about this is an idea. Uh, I think it would be smart, but at the same time, I acknowledge the challenges in doing it. Uh, but it would just be nice to have that. I thought last February was a was a solid event, and it was I, I heard no negatives from it. Uh, I thought it was good. Uh, I know I just I'll, COVID aside, I wish we were doing this. I, I think we should be doing what we did last year. But, okay, thanks.
Tamam. Mrs. Slotman? Mr. Carpenter? Yes. Mrs. Dorn? Yes. Mrs. Long? Yes. Mr. Price? Yes. Thank <laughs> you.